so that there's in Zoom um, a chat function. So to, unlike the uh, in-person class, you can ask questions through the chat. So look around in your screen there, there should be a little button that says chat. And then you can, um, when, you, when you have questions, you can ask your questions in chat. Also, if you don't mind, let us know where you're from. Um, give us the city or, or county that you're from so we can kind of get an idea where, where our people are from. Today's meeting will be recorded and you can see on my, my slide here um, that uh, you can go to Facebook Live and watch it or through Zoom as you're doing. And uh, the handouts are online. Um, so you can go to this website here, the ucanr.edu uh, sites, Amador County Master Gardeners, and look for the handout. Um, so in today's presentation, uh, we'll have Dennis Miller talking. Dennis Miller has been a Master Gardener since 2002, and he's been growing fruit trees at his uh, home in um, Amador County for about that same amount of time, about 18 years of growing fruit trees. So what, what Dennis is talking about today is how to grow fruit trees and keep them short. Um, so he's got an orchard of a dozen or so fruit trees and none of them are taller than six feet. So this is a way to keep us off ladders. Uh, none of us wanna be on ladders. I'm sure everybody could tell a horror story about somebody falling off a ladder and that's the last thing we want. So, um, let's see, I've talked about handouts, I've talked about chat, recording, okay, well, let's go. I've got a little video to start us off, and um, the video is, uh, shows Dennis in his orchard, uh, and you'll get to see from that what his orchard looks like, and uh, the amount of fruit he's able to produce in this very small orchard. And after the video with the orchard, Dennis will give a presentation about pruning. And uh, the advice is, this is the time of year that you would be pruning your trees while the leaves are still on the trees. Um, normally we give this class in person and we're actually all out in the orchard with our pruning shears, but um, not now. So let me start the video. And let's see. Raise your hand or something if you're unable to hear and we'll see if we can address that, but I think you should be able to hear it. My name's Dennis Miller. I'm an Amador County Master Gardener. Uh, I have a five and a half acre uh, property here. I have 26 fruit trees. Uh, I've got uh, raised bed gardens. I've got uh, five 24 foot raised beds and I've got uh, 18 50 gallon half drums uh, all under per permanent irrigation for, for my gardening. Uh, one of the things that's really important, I think, is uh, one is to keep your trees short like this. You don't have to use a, a ladder to go up Prune also it allows you to do your stuff like your garment sprays and, and they're pruning a lot easier. Uh, another thing is you need deer fencing. And deer fencing is, a, is mandatory uh, if, if you want to have uh, an orchard like this because deer can work these over really easy. We have a deer fence. What it is, it's a graduated size as far as the, the fence and the lower side keeps uh, your uh, rabbits out and it graduates up to a larger size. If you're only working with an orchard only, not a raised bed, but just an orchard, you can get away with having this as your fence. I use a six foot wire fence, 10 foot T post, two strands of bob wire. I've never had a deer go through this. They will jump six feet, I know that, but this gives me six plus an extra foot, foot and a half of uh, barbed wire. They don't, they don't go through this at all. This is a Gravenstein apple tree. It's grafted to M111 rootstock. Uh, I did this back in uh, 2015. 
since it's five years old. Uh, it was an M111 rootstock, and it's got it's a Gravenstein apple. And I probably thinned at least two to three hundred apples off of this about a month ago. So that's what's growing. This tree, if you can notice, I keep it short purposely. This this is an M111, which is a semi, uh, it's actually a semi dwarf, which would go up probably 20, 25 feet tall if you didn't keep it back. But I'm keeping this short purposely. This is what it looked like originally. This is a M111, I, or I, the graft is, I grafted on the Empire, or the um, Gravenstein, Gravenstein, and that's just what it looked like, and this is five years later. One nice thing about this is that you have a tree that's short enough, you don't need a ladder. When you do your dormant spray, you're going to use a lot less spray. Uh, you can hand pick. A lot of pluses for a backyard gardener, this is the ideal way of doing it. Again, this is a, a, uh, a plum tree, and again, this is, a, this is probably about 10 years old, and you notice it's just armpit tall, and it's got lots of fruit on it, and I've, again, it's been several, two or three hundred pieces of fruit I took off of it a month ago, so this is ripening up really quick. The uh, Flavor King Pluot. It gives a red pluot, it gives a seed that's very small in the center, lots of fruit on the outside. Excellent uh, for canning or just eating. Uh, and again, it's just at this height right now, we're probably just a little higher than my shoulder. And this, this is probably about 10 years old. This is a plum tree, and again, it's a standard size plum tree. It's not a, not a semi-dwarf. And you look at the fruit in here, and I've uh, thinned hundreds of pieces of fruit out of this about a month, month and a half ago. This is probably about three weeks from being ready to pick. Yeah, I think the important thing to realize as a home gardener or a home orchardist is if you keep your trees at a height that you can manage. This is this one here is about shoulder high, but at least normally I cut them off no taller than six feet tall. Keep them cut back every year at six feet tall. It makes it easier for you to do your maintenance on it. You can do your, your, <coughs> your pruning, you can do your garment spray. You're going to have more fruit than you know what to do with as a home, gourder, a home orchard. This is, I mean, there's probably well over 100 pounds of fruit on this little tree right here right now. And how much fruit do you really need as a home orchardist? Yeah, and the other thing is you don't have to climb a ladder. If you take this same tree, which is a standard sized tree, and it's 35 feet tall, even on an 18 foot ladder, you're still not getting to the top. And when you get to be my age at 79, uh, you don't need to be on the top of an 18 foot ladder reaching for fruit. Okay, this, uh... We're going to be putting bird netting on this. These are not ripe yet, but if I leave them any longer, the birds will be getting in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in here, I'm going to cut the top of this off shorter, just to us even, and then we'll put the net over top of it. So that will allow us to put the netting down here, and it'll be fairly flush. Now we've placed the bird netting. You see it flattened it out pretty good. And that'll keep the birds out. And what I'll do is I will eventually take and pull this back in all the way to the trunk and tie it up with the trunk. That keeps rats, foxes, things like that from going up into the tree. Otherwise, they will. I've, many times they come up here and I see foxes in the trees eating fruit. So it needs to be tied off right back against the trunk. Okay, this plum tree is ripe. We just took the netting off of it. And it's like a, a golf ball uh, carrier that you get from, the, from your golf club and put a hook on it. And we can just hang it, hang it go like that. And now you can just take and pick, 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 and drop them right back in the bucket. So here we picked the, the fruit. There wasn't a big, uh, a large crop of fruit for this particular uh, tree this year. We had hail. 
and lost a, a lot of the uh, blossoms on it. But there we got this fruit picked, and you'll show you what it looks like, and you go, mm. Mm -mm. Oh my goodness. Really sweet and juicy. <laughs> hey, this is a, uh, it's a, a pear tree, bear, bear, and this is where I normally prune this off, right here. So it's about six feet, that's where I cut it off. That's all new growth. Notice it's about two feet of new growth. <clears throat> we got our pears in here, but they're Bartlett. I said Bart, Bartlett. The thing is, I want to put bird netting on this because the birds will get into it. So I'm going to take and cut this off right back where I pruned it last year. By flattening it off, it will allow me to put bird netting on it without hanging it up. Do this all the way across the top. That will allow me to burden it and you go on it easily. You do need some shade for these this fruit. If you take and expose the fruit to full sun, they'll, they'll they won't hold up. But that's about off just about an inch higher than what it was taken off last year. It's a Bartlett pear tree that we took uh, uh, the top off of it about four weeks ago, so I could put put bird netting on it to protect the fruit from the birds. The thing is, is you don't want the fruit to ripen on the tree. A pear, if you let it ripen on the tree, the birds will nail it and it, and it won't be as good. So what you want is take and pull this up at 90 degrees. It should come right off. In fact, you can easily take and go like that. That's exactly the way they should be. They should not be ripe enough to eat. From here, they have to go in and go into a, a cool area in your house down low. Don't put them in the garage if you got your car in the garage it's going to be too high. So you put it put in a near the floor or on a low table or counter and hold these for about two to three weeks and then you'll these will be just beautiful. Again this is a Bartlett pear. They're, they're excellent eating and uh, this is just as out. Boom. Boom. Okay, the, the, you notice these pears look like they're they're really ripe. Well, what's happened? We've had triple digits now for a week as far as temperatures. It was 109 yesterday, and that has just got just plain hot. This is not. I don't normally like to pick them when they're already this color. It's ripe. There's another one, and it's it's ripe, but you don't want them to get quite that 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 color only because they will ripen up evenly. The color will be even if it's ripened up in the shade. Again, the birds will attack these. If I, if I had, I had the netting on this now for about four weeks. I took the netting off last night, so the birds haven't damaged it. But I left this tree open like this today. These would all be nailed. Yes, you'll see this rope in here. It's like a hay, hay or straw bale rope. What I did is I tied this off tied this down to pull this limb down and over before it was going up too straight and I want to fill this in and right behind it is another one at this area right here I've tied it off this limb came clear over here and there was a void and so I brought this back in here that gives me symmetric shape of a tree and that's once that stayed on there for a few months it'll stay that way Soup. Okay, this is we just picked this tree out. We didn't have to use a ladder. This tree is about six feet tall, and you can see the yield. And uh, again, how much fruit as a home gardener do you really need? But again, it's it's the best thing that we can do is uh, have it to where you don't get on a ladder. Well, that was our video and um, we're gonna have to switch over to Dennis now uh, to share his screen and present uh, the pruning techniques. Uh, so, so Dennis.
Go ahead, we can see your screen now. Okay, the uh, class we're doing today is called uh, Late Summer Fruit Tree Pruning. <clears throat> and I, you know, I have a, a, a lot of words that need to be talked or, or um, said here. And so I've got it down on this PowerPoint where uh, once you download this here in the future, at least you'll have all of it just like, uh, rather than have to make a lot of notes, this will give you a good uh, reference. Heading cuts. Let me get rid of this up here. Okay, a heading cut. That's the different types of pruning cuts. A heading is a terminal portion of the shoot or branch is removed and the basal portion remains attached. That terminal portion is considered the tip or the end of that branch. The basal portion is the branch limb itself. So that's just wanted to clarify what that meant. Oh. <clears throat> Avoid head cuts in the winter, making head cuts in late spring or uh, after the growth spurt, after the growth spurt or in August or September. If you want or need growth, head cut in the winter. Now this is totally different than what I learned back in the 50s when I was taking egg class, agriculture classes, we never pruned in the summer. We pruned only when it was completely dormant. So now what we're talking about is heading cuts themselves. If you make head cuts in the winter, it forces, forces a lot of extra growth on it. And wherever you head cut, the next, four, next three buds below that will take off like a porcupine. They'll grow like crazy. If you prune these in the spring, or not spring, but in the late summer after the fruit's picked, it won't force a lot of new growth. Now there's an exception on winter dormant pruning. And that would be, so it's kind of like geometry. You have exceptions. <laughs> Shoots and buds growing horizontally with the terminal end tipping lower than the limb can be headed without forcing new growth. So if you take right here, if this is attached to the trunk and this limb comes out and it goes down below this line here where it was attached, anything going up this way, if you cut on it, will cause more growth. If it's below this line, you can cut on it and it doesn't force new growth. That's really important. So you can prune in, a, in the winter if you need to, if the particular branch is hanging down. Thinning cuts. The entire shoot or branch are removed from the base. Thinning cuts eliminate, this is important, eliminate the big and keep the weak. Thinning cuts produce fruit. And let me back up here where it says thinning cuts eliminate the big and keep the weak. And normally you look at these branches and you see a, 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 a say a three eighths of an inch thick branch uh, coming off, or not the branch, but the, the, the uh, you know, the, the, yeah, it would be the branch. And you say, oh, that looks pretty good. And this little one next to it's about the size or even smaller than a pencil. You want to get rid of the larger one and keep the smaller one. The smaller one is going to produce more fruiting spurs on it. Relative effects of thinning versus heading. This will start to make sense now. If you take the terminal bud and remove it, let's go to this picture just below it here on the left. There's our branch, and we've taken every other one of these out. The red is where we're taking them out. We're leaving the, the black. So what we've done is we've actually thinned this by about 50%. The invigoration on that as far as more forcing a lot of new growth is small. And the fur, a spur formation next year is a lot more. So you're going to get more fruiting spurs by doing this type of pruning. And now a head cut is where you come in, make the picture on the right, and you have every single one of these little uh, ends of the branches have been trimmed off. So really, really what you've done is you've done a head cut 100% on this whole branch. So now what you're going to have in the winter is you're going to have every three buds below that cut 
are going to take off like a shot that's be like a porcupine, a lot of a whole lot of new growth. So the invigoration is large. Spur formation, you'll have less fruiting spurs when you do this type of cutting. Again, this is totally different than what I learned back in the 50s, but this is the way it's taught now and it works. Goals of the home orchard, I have trees that are structurally strong, bear high quality fruit of a size easy and safe to maintain. Now this picture here was a home, we did a uh, home public aid class about, oh, it's probably been about 12 years ago, maybe even longer than that. And this is an elderly couple. They had this tree that was growing all the way up, way, way up here. They couldn't pick any of the fruit anyhow. So what I did is it set a central leader with multiple branches coming out. I cut the whole central leader out of it completely. It took about 10 feet out of this tree. So now we have a tree that is probably about seven feet tall right here. But at seven feet, they can still manage it to get the fruit. And they can use a, a, an instrument to pull, the, pull the, the fruit off with it. They don't even have to have a ladder. But again, that's I, because this first set of limbs are coming out so high, I couldn't get this down to six feet because I would have wiped the whole tree out. But this is about seven feet, and it's very... Uh, worked out very well for them. If you look at the tree on, on this side, it's got lower limbs down in this area here. So this could be really cut back a lot shorter than, than the tree on the left. Together, pruning and training permit us to control the tree size, develop structural strength, dilute sunlight throughout the tree, renew flowering or fruit wood, and correct problems. For instance, in the winter, you could have a damaged tree. You could have had um, maybe another tree or you just broke a major limb out of the tree. Well, this the pruning allows you to go in there and correct those kind of problems. You need, you need air circulation within that tree. If you don't have good air circulation, as far as uh, both light and air circulation, they're gonna wind up with a, uh, a, a fungus and uh, diseases get in there where it's all closed off, doesn't have air circulation. Equipment needed for pruning. A bypass shear, that's two scissor-like blades. They pass each other and that's important. They make what is called an anvil shear that has a flat base and the Knife edge comes down on top of that flat base. And what happens, it can crush the backside of where you're trying to prune. So if it was, in my opinion, a bypass shear is most important. Again, keep all tools sharp. If you use a, a, a metal file, you can sharpen this in th two or three strokes with a metal file and it will work just fine. You wanna use, again, a bypass lobbers. This, this gives you a, a better reach and it gives you more strength to cutting a, a limbs that are probably inch, inch and a half thick. And you need a, a pruning saw of some type. Now these are just standards. If you want to get a little more uh, ambitious and then, and I have all this stuff, I use it. Here we have an 18 foot lobber pole saw. It's an extension saw. It, it, it unscrews and the thing goes out 18 feet. It has a lobber head right here, and it also has a razor saw. Get good equipment if you're going to buy equipment. A razor saw blade is wonderful. This is about 10 years old, that saw blade, and it still cuts like a razor. Really, really good. Another thing is an extension. This is a six-foot lobber. It's just like the other lobbers that I had uh, on the previous slide. But this allows you from whatever your height is to reach up into the end of the tree, another six feet to lob it. Works out really, really well. A power edger. You noticed in the uh, video that we showed earlier, I take and I just take and turn this upside down and I can cut the whole top of the tree out just in a matter of probably a minute or two, cut the whole top of it out completely. 
And that gives you a place to start when you start pruning it. At least you've got it down to a certain elevation. Another thing that works out well, especially if you have larger trees, and that would be an, a, uh, an eight foot pole chainsaw. And again, these are things you can still use the, uh, the uh, extension lobber pole saw. That will work just fine. But this is what's really good, especially when you got larger wood. If you got wood in there that's, uh, say, four inches up to a foot thick, this goes through it instantly. A tree size, a standard fruit tree stop normally can get up 25 to 30 foot tall. Semi-dwarf, 15 to 20 foot tall. A dwarf, eight to 10 feet tall. That's if you don't keep them pruned back. I personally prefer a standard size tree. They, they have a much, I would say the, the root uh, system on those things are much stronger and they will last for many, many, many years. Semi-dwarf, certain semi-dwarf trees are excellent. I don't personally care for dwarf. A dwarf, uh, you can put in pots and things like that, but as far as longevity, the dwarf doesn't last or, or hold up nearly as well. In our area here in the foothills, a semi-dwarf on apple trees, M111 rootstock is really excellent in the foothills. It, 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 grows excellent in the dry climate. The clay soil with rot is not a problem at all. Just a, a wonderful for an apple, M111. Some of the optional pruning systems. This is called on the left side is an open center. It looks, if you think of this as an upside down umbrella, this goes just like this. So you have lots of light this works perfect on uh, apples. And uh, I don't normally do this with pear trees. Pear trees need a little more shade. So if we go to a modified central leader where you have a row of limbs, come up about two feet or more, have another row of limbs. And in my opinion, if you keep that tree at about six feet, two rows of limbs on this modified central leader uh, will provide shade and uh, you have lots of airflow in here, air circulation. This works really, really good for pears. <clears throat> the central leader, the things like your uh, nut trees, your especially things like uh, walnuts. These things can go up 30, 35 feet, and that's fine because they use a shaker. They come in and they rattle the, the shaker will knock the nuts out of this. You're not climbing a ladder. And another option would be an espalier, which works out very, very well, especially with apples. I mean, you can, you'll, you'll have a ton of fruit in this. And all you do, in fact, I normally come up only with three levels, but this is probably an eight foot fence. So they got four levels. You'll get a ton of fruit out of this, just like that. When to prune, early spring. Prune stone fruits, peaches, nectarines, plums after the buds break. <clears throat> this is going to be just a little cleanup. So you've already pruned the previous summer, but this is early spring. This is the time to do it. In the summer, most important time to thin, head, or remove vigorous upright shoots to control tree height and develop branches. That's important because when this thing starts to grow, they, usually your buds start pushing in our area, they start pushing around. February. If you're down in the, the Bay Area, you're probably going to get buds pushing uh, in January but, or even earlier. But here in, in February, it starts to, the growth spurt starts all the way up till about the first of June. That's what it's really pushing. So it's important to go in there and keep these things cleaned up. When to prune again, late summer after fruit picking, control, shape, and new growth. What I do is, for instance, if I've got like uh, apricots, well, here in the foothills at 2,600 foot, you don't get apricots like you do out of the valley. You probably have the apricots, you know, the end of May, early June, or ch and cherries. Up here, I get them probably in uh, July. <clears throat> so what you'll have to do is, as soon as you pick your fruit, go ahead and do your pruning. You don't have to wait till, you know, 
September, October. You can do that immediately after picking. So I pick early in, in the summer or after fruit picking for both cherries and uh, apricots. Things like uh, apples will start coming in. Uh, we usually in August for uh, Gravensteins. If you're over in the, in the west side of the valley, you probably get uh, a whole month and a half earlier than that. But in our area, it would probably be August. So as soon as I pick the fruit, I prune it. Now, in the winter when it's dormant, there's no leaves on there at all. The absence of leaves allow you the clear view of the tree framework, thin or ahead any branches that were not adequately pruned in the growing season. So again, with no leaves on it, you see everything. And then you can go in there and do some fine tuning. Again, like geometry, an exception. Apricots should be pruned six weeks prior to the first rains or early spring after the rain stops. The branch killing disease, Eucopa dieback, can be a major problem for apricots during the wet season. That's really important. Things like pluots, which are a cross between an apricot and a plum, doesn't have to, you don't have to worry about this at all. But just a straight apricot by itself must be pruned six weeks prior to the first rain or after the rain stops in the uh, late spring. Upright growth patterns. Cherry, plum, pear, apple. They have a tendency to go straight up. And we, what we need to do is we want to open these up to an open center, spread them apart. Here I've used PVC pipe across here. You could use a stick. Uh, anything to pick and, and force these apart. Now this happens to be, there's no leaves in the tree, so this is, this is actually winter, but I would normally do this, especially around uh, April, May, when the wood starts to soften up. If you put too much pressure on these limbs uh, in the, when it's really cold, you'll break a limb. So you want these to be flexible. So I, I would do this normally probably in April into May and then let that stay like that uh, for several months. Another thing you can use, again, that was sticks, boards, water bottles, those water bottles out here, and you get up into these upper branches like this, you can force those out by taking water bottles, just take a, a, a piece of a old electrical wire with a shield on it, hang it in there, and if you have it full of water and it's too heavy, just pour part of the water out. So if you, this will give you a balance that works out really well. Another way is using rope. You can tie a rope around this and drag this down and tie it to your fence or tie it to a rock. It's kind of hard to see this, but here I've got this limb. It was going straight up and I've rocked the limb over and down to balance this tree out and tied it off to a rock. And this will, after a couple of months, this will stay like that and this will make this tree shaped more, a lot more better. Here we have got a water bottle hanging. I've got a smaller limb in here. I didn't need to tie it off a rope. All I wanted to do is I wanted it just to come down and by putting a, one or two water bottles in here, uh, right, will develop into a, a nicely shaped tree. Spreading growth patterns, apricot, nectarine, peach, almond. Forced outward and upward. Again, they wanna go up, so we wanna go out and then up. <clears throat> Why summer prune? Fruit needs light to ripen properly, puts an end into fruit production, or puts energy into fruit production. And you can see all this up here, well, it's not gonna get the sun that it needs. That's why this needs to be pruned several times during the summer as your fruit is ripening. And it doesn't have to be major, major pruning, just a matter of it allow it to get some light in there. Pruning cuts, it's important. Make a 45 degree angle cut across the branch to prevent water from ponding on it. These would be branches that are going up and out and facing upward. You would want a 45 degree angle so that the water can roll off of it easily. Make thinning cuts beyond the branch collar. Now notice the collar here. Don't cut the collar off and don't leave a stub beyond it. You leave a stub out here, 
that what can wind up getting a fungal problem or a disease and it will just, oops. Anyhow, I mean, okay, let me just back that back up. If, the, the, if this is stubbed off out here, it could get diseases in it. By cutting this off just at the very face of the collar, this will heal right over top of itself. It will just actually fold over. Even if it's a big cut, if that is a, even a, a limb that's a foot across, keeping that collar allows it to heal and it'll eventually close off. This is another important thing. Back in the 50s, we used like a, a tar type material to seal off the wounds. Well, today, leave the pruning cuts open. No emulsions, zero. When you put like a tar or other types of material on there, when it dries out, it cracks and you get moisture back underneath and you wind up with disease and uh, fungal problems started up underneath. If you leave it open, within just a few days, it dries off and it will start to heal. This is a Lambert cherry tree planted and then head cut back in February 07. And this, I didn't have, at this time, I didn't have a fence in here for deer fence. I was gonna just put a cage on it. You can see the top of the tree here. You buy a $35 tree, it's seven feet tall, and I cut it off right in my pocket. If this was behind a deer fence, I would cut it off right at my knee high at about 18 inches. So this is probably about 30 inches. That's about 18 inches. Again, if I cut this off at 18 inches, the limbs all start low. Now you want pruning limbs from down here all the way up to about six feet. So you have a lot more volume of fruit that way. So again, that was in February 07. This is September 07. This is about, what, about six, seven months later. Look at the new growth on that same tree. This is all brand new. I've actually tied this back with a rope. So all four limbs are uh, going to an outward and up pattern rather than straight up. Pruning controls the tree size, the tree shape, the tree structure. Notice this is probably about nose high on me, and I'm gonna cut this back over 50% this first year. Pruning the young tree, it makes good foundation, makes stronger branches, stronger root system. What we're doing is we're building a foundation here for the future. I'll give you a good example. I, I did a home visit here this last winter. We had, we'd had some really nasty winds up in the 50, 60 mile an hour winds. And this, this uh, individual had a apple tree that he never pruned it back properly. And it had, this apple, was, apple tree was probably about, oh, maybe, maybe 10 feet. These branches, really scrawny little branches, about 10 feet long. He had apples on there about the size of softballs. When that wind got in there with, with fruit on it, it broke the tree in half all the way to the ground. Couldn't salvage it all, but it was so weak, it couldn't support itself. So what we're doing here is we're building a foundation. These limbs here will develop a lot stronger. And you can see, we've got this. You can leave this with three or four branches. This has got three or four here. Actually, it's four. And it's in a wagon wheel shape. So each one goes out in a different direction. That allows you to get in here to pick fruit very easily. And what you want is you want this attachment to the trunk it should be at a 45 degree angle. Never on a, if it's a 90 degree angle, the limb will break when it's loaded. And if it's too steep, as far as it goes up, say uh, a lot higher than uh, 45, it will also break. It'll break and peel off. So you want a, the attachment at a 45 degree angle. This is two years later. That's the same Lambert cherry tree. Notice I put in a fence, by the way. But look at, look at how strong these limbs are now. So anything that's developing above it is going to have lots of strength. This is December 09. So it's actually about two and a half years later from the time that I planted it. 
There's a Fuji apple, and this is behind fence, and this was done in February 07 also. And uh, I had cut that off at knee high, and this is all what's been developed by September. So this has been about seven months, I guess. So you can see the length here is shoulder high. We're coming in and we're gonna shorten it way up. A lot shorter now, but that's gonna give strength in these areas. And you see, I got one, two, three, four. It's gonna be a good scaffold. This is the same tree, and this has been uh, since 07, so that's what, uh, yeah. This, this is just this last, early this month. There's a six foot wire right through here. Oops, let me go back and previous. So I went in there with my hedger and I cut the top out of that tree at six feet completely. And then what I do is you see, we got three branches or three branches, I said division, one branch, three smaller branches coming off of it. What you do is take the center branch out completely. Now you have more light, more airspace in between. If you took, and say cut one of these off, you wouldn't have near the space. Here you get this cut off right here. You got a lot more airspace and also trim the top on it. Short it up. Here's another one here. We got a branch coming right out of the center here. There's a branch coming off to the right and to the left. We're gonna cut this off right here. Now we have lots of airspace. You'll have a lot less chance of uh, having fungal problems and disease problems. Center needs to be opened up. And you notice all these like uh, little sucker shoots coming up here. These should have been pruned off a long time ago, but I left these only because I wanted to take some pictures of what happens if you don't prune them off. I want this to be an upside down umbrella. I want this open. So I'm gonna cut these off all the way back not all the way to the branch below it. But what I'm going to do is I want to leave one or two buds at the base to protect it from sunburn. So what we're doing is we're kind of come back and you can see right in here, there's one leaf right here. So I need to cut this off. Oops, darn it. And then here I'm cutting this off. Gonna leave that one, one leaf. And that'll help protect, as this develops with some leaves on it, it'll protect this from sunburning right here. Very important. If you only think and wipe out all of these leaves completely, you know, these branches right down flush, then you're gonna get sunburn in there and then you'll have a real, real problem as far as the disease. Interior branches. And again, this is high, kind of hard to see. This is, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm going from the outside of the tree into the middle to show that we've got, we don't have any branches coming back in toward the center. Darn it. We don't want to have any branches coming back into the center of the tree. Everything is going outward. And again, on a ladder, I can look back down and the center of the tree is opened up right now. And this again is late summer pruning. We've already picked the fruit. So this will be already pruned and I can do a little touch up in the, in the winter if I need to. And there, there's an 18 foot ladder. There's a six foot high tree. Jeez. Six foot high tree, 18 foot ladder. You have an option if you have to be on top of an 18 foot tree and reaching for fruit way up in here someplace, or here I could pick it right from the ground. We're starting a derelict orchard. In September, right now, you can remove up to three major limbs to provide better light distribution. We're talking about, we're talking about real limbs. We're not talking about little limbs that are a, a couple of inches across. We're talking about limbs that may be uh, four or five inches or even a foot across where possibly an older derelict tree is growing back in toward the center. You want to open it up 
take three major limbs out. Again, if they're smaller ones, a couple of inches, then you can take as many as you want. Peel new shoots as necessary in April and May. It may be necessary to repeat this several years in a row to achieve the desired shape. Now, that one thing about pruning wood older than two years old it causes water sprouts. And that's not something that you can do anything about. It's just happened. And if it's over two years old, you're going to get water sprouts. So you want to go in there and they will continue to grow through late summer. Remove the water sprouts in April and May just by peeling them off. You can just take your thumb and shove on it and you'll peel right off clean. Later in the summer, you'll have to go in there with a pair of shears and trim them off. <clears throat> and again, if, if it's an area where it may cause sunburn, you, what you'll do is come up one or two buds and cut that water spot off, off of it and then leave that little stub just to uh, leaf out and protect your limb so it doesn't uh, sunburn. Another option is if your tree has been damaged and you're missing an area in that portion of the tree where you need to limb, you can take a water sprout and bend that water sprout out with a, uh, with a piece of rope, bend it out, trim the top off of it, but leave the, the lower half of it maybe coming outward into that void area. And you can use that, will create a new limb. And we did this this week. I did this up with uh, John Weimer. He has a, a, a old apricot tree. It's not really a derelict tree. It's just, it hasn't been pruned for many years. So what we did is put the ladder in here and we trimmed this back. You can see, oops, I don't want to do that. Darn it. Got to quit pushing on this thing. Okay. So what we're going to do is come across here, and this is what we decided for the height that we wanted on this particular tree. So we've opened this up right here, and you can see how much more we have to take out of it. So we're taking seven to eight feet out of the top of that tree, and then we're going to go in and clean up all the inside of it. You can see this has been trimmed off back here, and we're still working on it, and there it is after it's all cut off. So that's about, you know, again, you get eight feet cut off of it, you're gonna have apricots that you may be able to get, get a hand on. Uh, this could probably go back even, even further, but they had a huge amount of fruit on this tree last year. And we figured, well, we'll just go ahead and let this fruit out again next year. And if they wanna shorten it up more, they can. It's a pear tree in late summer. This is an older picture. This is a, the same pear tree that was on the video we had earlier, but this has been, uh, probably five or six years ago. So when I come in here and I do, I cut this off, it's actually less than six feet. Now we've got it, it's, it's at six feet uh, today, but that was cut off at six feet. I mean, it's uh, today's tree is six feet. This is probably just shoulder high. And the following summer, it was loaded with fruit. And this was August this year, and you could see it's, I mean, how much fruit do you really need off of one tree as a backyard home guard or home orchardist? Pluot's the same thing. This is a, uh, an older picture uh, where we got uh, just this tub off of here, one picking. I got about four tubs off that tree this year. That's, and that's a lot of fruit for one little tree. And that tree is just shoulder high. The key to pruning. Major winter pruning will cause more vigorous growth. Keep that in mind. Understand the timing and regulation of vegetative growth allows predictable response to certain types of pruning. Remember we talked about head cutting and thinning. The point is summer pruning retards growth, but it also increases fruiting spurs. You'll get more fruit by doing summer prune than if you do winter prune. And, uh, if you go back to winter prune, if you have a tree that needs growth, for some reason, you know, you've, you've had, had some major damage, 
from uh, uh, winter damage of some type. In that case, you may want to do a winter prune just to force more growth. The references for this type of pruning basically was uh, a class I took uh, up at Apple Hill about, oh, it's been probably at least 10, maybe 12 years ago. Uh, they were doing, uh, John and uh, Kevin Day were giving a, a class for uh, orchard people and their employees that were doing the pruning. And I was invited to come to that class. And this is where I learned about doing summer pruning. And I'll tell you, it makes a huge difference compared to what I used to do from the 50s was always a winter pruning. Another thing you might be interested in is, is this book. You can get this, your Master Gardener uh, extensions can get these for you. And I'm sorry, I don't remember what the price is on it, but it's an excellent book. This is kind of like the Bible for, for home orchards, in my opinion. It's four colored pictures. It talks everything about planting. Uh, it talks about the different varieties of uh, fruit trees, uh, how to prune it, how to fertilize it, how to irrigate it, also uh, how, to, how to store the fruit. Excellent book. I would very strongly recommend it. And by the way, my name is not an author. It's just my book. Thanks for your attention. Have any questions on fruit tree pruning? Yes, Dennis, we have some questions. Um, let me start out. The first one says, late July pruning of espalier apples produced new growth shoots at the cut on all six lateral branches. How frequently or how many cutbacks are suggested before leaf drop? All the videos suggest summer pruning produces fruit spurs, winter pruning produces limb growth. You have anything else to add to that one? And that last part you just said, yes, that's correct as far as the winter pruning produces a lot more growth as far as the uh, on all the branches. The point is, is you don't want to do a major pruning until after you pick the fruit. And I'm going to suggest if you're, if you're pruning heavily in July, I don't think the apples have already pruned. Come out unless, unless you're over at the Bay Area where you've got gravity steams that are there. My, 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 my gravity steams is in August, they were 26 for the elevation. Uh, again, you may have to go in if it will produce a little new growth, but not nearly as much growth as it would be as if you did a totally garment prune. If you do a dormant prune, you have a whole lot more growth. Okay. Okay, so. Your 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 audio sort of garbled on that. You want to synth you, you want to summarize that and say it one more time. Dennis, why don't you stop screen sharing? It might help the audio. I'm sharing. Okay, okay, is that any better? No. <laughs> it's a little better. Is it just garbled, or is it not speaking loud enough? It's just garbled. Okay. Again, pruning in July. Uh, I, think I think it's a little bit early. Unless you're in the Bay Area where you've got gravistines that are right early. I've got my gravistines are, and I don't develop, I don't have, I can't pick them until uh, late August at 2600 foot elevation. Um, so I do not do a heavy prune until after. Is picked. You want to get some, some, some new growth shoots, but not nearly as much growth as you're going to have if you do a 